We're going to get to Isaiah 50, or 65 in just a few minutes, but uh, John chapter 8, when I was at the men's retreat, I was talking to one of the guys, Brandon, uh, which a number of you have watched his video, as we had suggested, um, from the Owls. Uh, this one wasn't uh, video. The ones he did here weren't videotaped. I don't know if they exist elsewhere. I'm going to find out, though. Um, but uh, he was talking just to us as a, a group. Um, and we were talking, as preachers do oftentimes, with shortcuts and the shorthand that exists. But he was talking about, he was talking about the questions that he asks people when they begin to study. And one of the first questions he likes to ask them is... If you found the group that most closely resembles the Word of God in the New Testament, would you care what name was on the building? I'll ask it again. If you found the group that most closely resembles the Word of God in the New Testament, would you care what name was on the building? Or would the name on the building matter? When we open our Bibles here to John chapter 18, I want you to ask yourself a question. What does God's people look like? Now, as we open here in John chapter 8, you're going to see that the Jews had an idea of what God's people looked like. And, and it was just them. <laughs> it was being Jewish was what it looked like to be God's people. And that's a lot of what Isaiah is dealing with in Isaiah, the whole book of Isaiah, practically. Many of the other prophets deal with the exact same problem. The Jews had this idea that being a specific skin color, being from a specific heritage, having the same father physically as in Abraham meant that you were automatically God's people. And what Isaiah has dealt with for practically 66 chapters and Jesus deals with a whole lot more is that what makes a person God's is not what they look like. It's not even effectively where they park their rear when it comes time to praise and worship God. Their actions determine that. Their attitudes determine that. If we open here, John chapter nine or John chapter eight, beginning there in verse thirty-seven, look at he says here, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. He's already making an allusion to their father, and it's not Abraham. He says, they answer and said to him, Abraham is our father, which he absolutely knew was coming. I could see that coming from a mile away. If you knew the Jews, you knew that was coming. He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Being a child of Abraham, a descendant of Abraham, one of Abraham's children had nothing actually to do with physically being in his lineage. Nothing to do with being a byproduct of relations all through the history of the Jews. It had to do with who you were as a human being, the choices that you made, and that is demonstrated explicitly so in primarily the two women that are there in Jesus' lineage that are named from the Old Testament, Rahab and Ruth. Fantastic women who made incredible choices, but weren't Jews, <laughs> weren't descendants of Abraham at all, and yet they become part of God's people in a most particular way, in an incredible way. And even the line of David following through to Jesus. The people of God, God's people, they don't physically look like a specific thing. But they do look like, they look like God when it comes to the decisions they make. And they're going to go on. Look at, look at continuing in verse 39. If, you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. That's not how Abraham was. Now, if Abraham had done things like that, then you would absolutely be children of Abraham. And now he's going to turn the tables. He says, then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now they're turning the tables again. 
They're, they're changing their story. Well, we're children of Abraham. Well, you don't really do what Abraham did. No, no, we're children of God, right? They're going to throw the gauntlet down. He says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is the father, he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, when Brandon said that, when he told me this question that he asked, he was challenging people to be okay with walking away from what they consider God's people. Because we as human beings, we like to label things. We like to have tight and, 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 or tidy and neat ways of differentiating things from one another. And I'll tell you, I, I thought that was the case in the denominational world. And it took me a while to realize that there really aren't any tidy or neat labels on anybody. Very few people fall into the denominational theology that they claim. I have family members who think they're one thing, and by definition, they are an entirely different thing as far as the denominations are concerned. And the denominations are okay with that by and large, which is interesting to me. They, they, they bleed between each other. They share common ideologies and beliefs, but they don't care one bit that they disagree on certain things. I have had issues before with... Uh, <laughs> With preachers' meetings that I've had uh, locally, with uh, uh, or um, uh, I forget what it's called now, but a number of the preachers in the area would come together, even in the denominational world, and and try to get things done for God, and it never worked out because I held a standard that oftentimes they didn't. And it wasn't so much that they got angry at me; it was that they realized that. I was asking questions that got them angry at each other. And I was always like, how can you work with this person when they believe something intrinsically different from you and you're supporting their work, which is supporting some ideology that you don't believe in or you absolutely disagree with? And then they started to think, which was a wild idea, I guess. And they began to argue, which they didn't before because no one was asking questions. No one care that people believe different things, and I want to see that when, I don't want to see that, but I want us to see that when we get here to Isaiah chapter 65, which we should be there now, if you can join me here, Isaiah chapter 65, what do God's people really look like? And if you look at the title, it's, it's in quotations, the first one, his people, compared to being his people. And we like titles, again, we like to believe that things are right and good, and oftentimes we like to think that because our rear ends are parked in pews in the Church of Christ, that everything is right and good with the world, and that is simply not the case. It is far more than that. Being God's people is not gathering with the saints on Sunday. It is who we are. It is who we choose to be on a daily basis because our relationship with God is far more than this place. This is a part of it. But it is far more than this location or wherever we might meet with the saints. It is who we are on a day-to-day -day basis and the choices that we make. And that's what sets God's people apart and always has. Look at what the people claiming to be God's people, look what they do in verse 2. He says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. <clears throat> he says, who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. That's going to be a recurring theme here, according to their own thoughts. Thoughts. Look at this. A people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick. They're committing idolatry while claiming to be God's people. Not a new thing, right? Isaiah himself has dealt with it numerous times. He says, look at, look at verse 4. Who sit among the graves and spend the night in tombs. That's not because they're really interested in history. 
That's because they're either worshiping or trying to commune with the dead. These individuals are taking part in, in pseudo-religious practices that involve perhaps even making deals with the dead, of, of arguing and trying to find things out from spirits that are long past. Who eat swine's flesh. These Jews eat swine's flesh. And if you know anything about being a Jew, traditionally, that is the one of the biggest no-nos. It should be, it shouldn't be the biggest no-no because it's a physical thing. There are a lot worse things they could do, but all of them, all of them come around to they're defiling themselves and they're deciding what is right and good for themselves rather than allowing God to decide. Now, what do you suppose? I think the major problem in the religious world today is people try to decide what is right and good rather than allowing God to decide and just falling in line. We have a responsibility to be God's people, not simply pretend to be God's people or try to look what we think God's people look like. We need to make sure that we're doing it. He says, and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels. And when when I read this, I thought of I thought of this Greek uh, or Roman uh, practice of leaving fish in a jar outside your door in the sun. They call it garum, and they put it on everything and wonder why they're sick all the time. They always thought people were trying to kill them. Somebody is. It's you. You keep putting this stuff on your food. It's no good. Quit it. But as detestable as that idea is, consider leaving fish in a jar. For a few days. Go ahead and spread that on your toast. It sure does give flavor. Not one you want, but flavor. Wow. And that's what he's comparing this to. Broth of abominable things in their vessels. They're hiding it, right? They're, they're keeping it to themselves. And look in verse 5 at the type of things that they say. Verse 5 sounds like the world we live in today. He says, who say these people, they keep saying, keep to yourself. Do not come near me, for I am holier than you. They have no interest in discussing what the word of God really is. And when Isaiah comes to let them know, to talk to them, even perhaps to discuss with them, they want nothing to do with it. They shut down all conversation. I'm all right. You're all right. As long as you are not intolerant. And to them, that means disagree. As long as you don't disagree with me openly, as long as you don't say that what I believe or what I'm doing is wrong, then we can be fine. And that's really what they're looking for. They're looking for yes men to line up and to all be, as we talked about this morning, at peace with one another. And I think that's what Jesus wants. Well, if that were the case, I, I don't think he would have cast individuals out of the temple in John 2. I don't think he would have anticipated or demanded that his disciples and those following him would answer with truth when people teach things that are false. This is the attitude of the world around us, and too often, friends, we have simply fallen in line because it was easy, because it kept the peace, because it didn't make people upset. And I'll tell you, yesterday, both lessons yesterday, they went Brandon and, and Aaron both talked about things from different perspectives. Because Brandon has been in the field, and some of you have been there. Some of you have been in the field, and he's spent time in really awful places where there was a, large, a very high likelihood that he might very well die in the scenario. So you know people who are like that, who were in those kinds of situations. And Aaron has spent a good deal of time... He calls it a digital ministry, and it's something that I'm trying to develop on uh, for myself as well. Um, using digital media and the access that we have to the world around us to share the gospel. And in such, he hears such horrific stories. And he sees such incredible, incredible levels of faith that challenge you as a human being, as a Christian. That we live in a very pampered world, and... The worry that we have is whether the person that we're talking to about God, well, they might not like us when I'm all is said and done. Well, they might not talk to us anymore. There are places in the world, a lot of places in the world, that if this goes wrong, if this study goes wrong, if me talking to this person about God goes wrong, they could report me to the government, and the government would legitimately murder you. 
That's not a joke. That's not an understatement. The government comes and they take you away and, well, I don't know that they murder you, but you don't reappear. And we are so overly concerned with what our neighbor might feel about us. We are very pampered people. And we let these kinds of things keep us from teaching God's word, from instructing our neighbors, from giving them the opportunity to be saved because because they might get upset. Because they think they're holier than than us, more precisely holier than, than God in truth is what they think. These are smoke in my nostrils, he says. You ever had that? Have you ever had smoke in your nostrils? I have this knack for being wherever the smoke is coming off the fire, and it will follow me. It's awful. I love campfires, but not for very long because pretty soon the smoke is following me, and that is an awful feeling to get it in your nostrils. It dwells there for a good long time. It disturbs the flavor of everything that you eat from then for the next couple of hours. He says, a fire that burns all day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, God says, but will repay, even repay into their bosom for iniquity and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, who have burned incense on the mountains and blasphemed on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. We were studying, I think it was Monday, Dan and I were studying uh, uh, first Samuel and uh, there's this time where where Saul is supposed to wait for Samuel to arrive and the armies of the Philistines have gathered and they are looking ominous and they are huge and his people in part because of their own fear and their own lack of faithfulness in God they hide in holes and they run to every which direction to get away and Saul was supposed to wait. He was not supposed to sacrifice to the Lord, and he should have known exactly that. In fact, he waits for a little while, but then the time has been too long. And so he goes to sacrifice to the Lord, and immediately after he does, guess who shows up? It's not a coincidence that he shows up right after Saul sacrifices. Whether it was Samuel that delayed or God that delayed him, Samuel arrived right on time to see the abomination that Saul partook in, and all he had to do was wait. All he had to do, like we, is trust in God, is know that his will will be done, and if it's God's will that we be wiped off the earth, we're not going to stand in his way. And if it's God's will that we be vindicated against our enemies, it doesn't matter how many they are and how few we are. We will win the day if it's God's plan that we win. We need to get that through our heads. The Israelites needed to grasp that, even though they had so many examples. In fact, just a little bit later, in fact, in the same chapter, I believe, Jonathan does this incredible thing where he decides that he's going to instigate this situation. And so he, he goes down the valley and climbs up the other side, and he and his armor bearer alone, no one else, goes to approach the camp of the Philistines. And he tells his armor bearer exactly his plan. If he approaches them and they say welcome and they greet them and they offer them in, I'm going to go in. And if they tell me to stop, we're getting out of here. And to him, that was a message effectively to God. He set the parameters and then God told him what he should do. And so they invite him in and he goes in. And he and his armor bearer killed, what is it, 20 men? 20 men in a ruckus, and the ruckus that's caused there is amplified by an earthquake that somehow happens. And the whole issue, uh, or the whole ensemble of Philistines at this camp all draw their swords and are killing each other when Saul arrives. It started with two men. And you know what Jonathan said to his armor bearer? The Lord is able to deliver by many or by many. For you. Friends, we serve the same God Jonathan did. And if we serve him in the same way, we can do some pretty spectacular things. Not for our own glory, not because we'd like to pat ourselves on the back, not because we'd like to think we look like God's people, but because we'd actually be God's people. We would trust in him. What kind of things would we be involved in if the only things we'd ever do were things we know we could accomplish on our own without God's help. 
we, a lot of congregations would be exactly where they are. Now, what if, like Jonathan, we had faith in God to help us through, and when we came up with weird ideas or big ideas, we pursued them, and then asked God for help along the way. Lord, can you take care of these parts that I can't? Or there's these things that I, I need to fall into place in order for this to work. And what if we fail? What if it doesn't work? We wasted some time. But we sit so often on our laurels and we just say, well, that would never work. Well, how would we ever accomplish that? So we do nothing? Jonathan was not one to sit around and do nothing. Not when there was an enemy at the gate. And friends, there is an enemy at our gate. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There are people in the world who need the gospel, who want the gospel. There are people in our neighborhood that want the gospel. And there are things that you can do to help bring the gospel to them. We'll be talking about that in the near future. But just being an advocate for God, just sharing his message, just telling people about how blessed you are to be his, and the things that he's doing for you, is a big step in the right direction. They were not interested in the truth, and Paul dealt with similar individuals. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul talks about, to Timothy, he tells him to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It's a fairly familiar time we live in today. They lived in it then. He's not just talking about the 21st century. He's talking about from the 1st to the 21st century. People have always not wanted to hear the truth. Does that mean we don't preach it? Does that mean that we shirk away, that we don't share the gospel? It means that we preach exactly how we would have. In verse 11, look at, he says, But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain. That's a big one. Remember that. Who forsake my holy mountain. It's going to come up in a second. Who prepare a table for Gad and furnish a drink offering for men. Then he's a false god, and so is Gad. They perform idolatrous practices. Therefore I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. There it is. What separates God's people from God's people, right? The, People who think they're God's people from people who actually are God's people. It was the choice that they made. They kept choosing the wrong thing. And they refused to change. Look at verse 13. He's going to separate the two groups. He says, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. But he's talking to God's people. What are you talking about? They're servants and then there's us? I don't understand. How are we not your servants, God? Because you keep choosing the wrong thing. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, and, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. And then he's going to talk about a new heaven and a new earth, which we'll talk about next week, in fact, so we don't go there yet. So what does it look like? What do God's people look like? God's true people, the people who follow him? Look at verse 1. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine a people that look like God. What does that look like? Well, look at verse 1. After all he said from verse 2 on, so what he was reaching out to all the time, continually, was a people who would reject him, who would not want have a, to have anything to do with him, who would provoke him to anger. But look at verse 1. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, in the nation that was not called by my name. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Gentiles. There were Gentiles even in the days of Isaiah that saw the God of heaven and earth. And it wasn't just to have something, to get something out of him, though that does happen from time to time. Naaman is a great example of that. But at the end of the story, Naaman even chose a 
somewhat of a level of respect to the God of heaven and earth when he asks if he could take some dirt back home. And I wonder if God's not up there going, that was a good effort, David, <laughs> right? Like, that's impressive considering. And that's a lot of where I come to in, like, church history and, and, and the things that people have done in the past. It, it is impressive sometimes how far someone might come, even if they, they take an errant turn along the way. I look at where they came from, and I see how far they got, and I wonder what God thinks of that. There are a number of people who didn't reach an understanding of the church like we have, and an understanding of God's will as we would understand it, and did, did open up the door to a number of false teachings. But I look how far they made it, and I have to respect that anyway. They tried. They got distracted with some things, but they tried, and that's impressive on its own, wherever they are in the grand scheme of things. In Acts chapter 17, remember what Paul says to those on the Areopagus? He talks about the statue to the unknown God. In Acts 17, in verse 22, he says, uh, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He's complimenting them. He's not chastising them. They were. They were very committed. Even to the degree they didn't want to leave anyone else, so they had an unknown God statue just in case. And he says, Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And I have to imagine knowing what I know of Greek and Roman philosophy and the deities that existed, that's got to drop your jaw. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, and then he's going to keep going, and their jaws, I don't know how far unhinged their jaw can get, but it's going to keep going. He says, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Are you kidding? Like, that's a spectacular concept, a God that doesn't need man. Because every god in their theology needed man in order to exist, in order to have power, in order to be able to do anything, which was the hook that kept them coming back. You might serve Zeus, but if you don't support him continually, you don't get other people to support him, the god that you're supporting won't have the power to do anything for you anyway. That is an insane hook. That is a clever marketing campaign if I have ever heard of one. And now... Paul would introduce a God that doesn't need man? There's a lesson for the church as well. God doesn't need us. He chooses to use us. Again, he could find way better ways of doing what he needs to do than involve us. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God is the one who gives, not man to God. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. From each one of us, Paul says. He is looking square in the eyes of a bunch of people who believe in gods that don't exist who ridiculed him earlier in the day. And now he looks at them and he says, you're not so far from God. Paul would know about being far from God or feeling like you're far from God. He says, none of us are so far from God that there's not hope. None of us are so far from God that we can't be redeemed. For in him we live and move and have our being. Also, some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. The idea that we could be children of the gods was their concept. But he's like, they're actually closer than you think. You don't have to be Zeus, or you don't have to be uh, Hercules to be an offspring of the gods. You don't have to be a demigod to be an offspring of God. We are all his children. God is enthusiastic about being sought. Isaiah concludes it. Paul concludes it. God wants us to seek him, and God wants us to help others who are seeking him. In verse 24, back in Isaiah chapter 65, look, he says, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. That's phenomenal. You know, before you pray to God, 
He already knows what's wrong. Now that's not to discourage you from praying. But that's to speak to the level of understanding God has concerning the universe that we exist in. Of our needs. Of our hopes and our dreams. Of our problems. And look at verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. And dust shall be a serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. We'll talk about this next week too, but think about that. How the world would have to change for these things to be true. And yet, God made it possible. Not necessarily in the physical, but most certainly in the spiritual. Look at chapter 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Whenever he begins with that, you know something, something wild is coming and it's no different here. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? This is very similar to the question God asked David when David wanted to build him a home. Now, David's intentions were entirely pure. He understood that I have a home. I appreciate the home that I have. I recognize that God constructed it, and Lord, I want to build you a home. There was no malice. There was no ill will. There was no braggadociousness. There there was nothing in David but a love for God. And again, I have to imagine, or I wonder, I suppose, does God look down at David and go, man, you were so close. <laughs> man, you were so close. And yet, that was inevitably his plan, to make the tabernacle ultimately, or the temple in this case. See, the tabernacle already exists, but to have a temple, have a place that would be set up, and David wanted to build it, and God said... No, your son's going to have to build it because you have blood all over your hands, and that's good. It's good that you do. You need it to do things in the community, in the world around you, to be a king of war so that you can solidify the power of the Israelites behind the throne so that your son doesn't have to. And the Israelites met a level of prosperity that they would never see again because they made poor choices. But Solomon built the temple because David prepared the way. David had a love for God, and that's not what these Israelites are saying. The Israelites are practically saying, what about the temple, God? But we sacrifice at the temple, and our fathers built the temple, and they want God to give them a cookie. And God says, no. He says, what is the temple to me? Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Do I need this building? Who needs this building? The Jews. God doesn't need the building. He doesn't need to play a place to rest his head. He, he dwells in heaven. The temple is a shoddy example of heaven. It is the dregs of the world compared to heaven. It is abominable compared to where he really dwells. But he wants to dwell in a particular place with his people for the time. But they're bragging about it. He says, for all these things are... All these things my hand has made, and all these things exist as the Lord, but on this one will I look, 